go through and you develop this great vision statement. You want to make your community more walkable. You got this great document, this beautiful active transportation plan that talks about adding trails and bike lanes and improving sidewalk connectivity and things like that. Uh, and then you didn't update your codes and ordinances. So then somebody comes in to rebuild and then they're building the road the same way that it's been built for the last 30 years. Um, because you didn't change your roadway design standard, you didn't update your comprehensive plan, uh, you didn't look at those connections between land use and, and transportation and even development standards, the little things we talked about. Well, how is the building oriented to the, to, is it oriented to the parking lot or is it oriented to the street to make it easier to walk to or, or not? Does it have a huge parking lot in front? Everybody just comes and parks. And then you have to, if you're walking, you actually have an extra 50 to 100 feet just to even get to the front door. So little development standards like that and your roadway design standards are important. So when you do that active transportation plan and you have that vision for your community, don't forget to update all the other things that you can use to actually enforce how people build things uh, in your community. And there's still some examples that we see uh, in Pennsylvania, and I know this is kind of common. You know, this is one of those things. This is a neighborhood street, uh, and you could see it's 40 feet wide. Um, I don't know uh, what you think about neighborhood street designs, but uh, I think that's pretty excessive. And, and it's, uh, you know, what do you think are some of the negative aspects of having a street like this in a neighborhood that's 40 feet wide? What's going to happen on this street? Now, Holly's saying a recipe for high speed. Yeah, you feel safer to drive faster. Exactly. So that's the thing. So everybody that lives on the street, they're going to come to your council meetings and they're going to sit there and say, people are speeding down my street. And you're going to look at the street and say, yeah, well, it's designed for people. And just to show you how it gets to that, um, you know, this is how the street was designed. It had an eight foot parking lane, a 12 foot travel lane, 12 foot travel lane in the other direction and an eight foot parking lane on the other. There's your 40 feet. Okay, very, very wide, just encourages speed. And this is very hard to deal with. Once you have a, a street like this, uh, it's very hard to come back, uh, even with traffic calming concepts, and say, well, what can we do about it to fix it? And again, it's one of those things, well, if you build it right in the first place, then you wouldn't have to come back and, and fix it either. Uh, so that, that's kind of the problem. So we see a lot of this, unfortunately, in Pennsylvania. And even in communities that have beautiful active transportation plans or com street, complete street policies and things like that, if they actually don't change what their regulations and ordinances say and require developers to build, they could still build this stuff and it's not a problem. Uh, here's a different street. Uh, here you can see it's 28 feet wide. Uh, it has parking on both sides. And, and what do you think about this street design? Is this good? Is this okay? Does it have design flaws too? Uh, is it better than the other street? If you were going to buy a house, would you buy a house on this street or would you buy a house on the street on the, on the previous slide here? What do you think about this street design? Uh, from, again, from good, bad uh, perspectives here. Let's see, if we could post some things. So this is actually, it's tight. It's very tight. Um, the parking does act as chicanes. This is one of those streets where, again, you know, you can see the vehicle down there and the, the green one there in the middle. Um, if you have uh, one car coming along, the other car has to pull off and wait. So it does act as a form of traffic calming. Um, it definitely works on low volume roads. I would not do this for a collector street or higher volume street as, as a couple of folks have pointed out. Uh, so it does work for the lower volume streets. Um, we do get some folks that don't like this. Uh, you, you folks that, that plow roads, um, this, you, you don't like this kind of street. We know that. Uh, we also know that uh, the, the, the chief, the fire chief does not like this street either because it's difficult to you know, find a place to park their vehicle and all that. Uh, but you know, otherwise for a neighborhood, this works great. It actually self-regulates the speed uh, by having the parking on there. Um, it actually self-regulates traffic volume. So from a traffic perspective, it works. Um, it's interesting. This is actually a street from uh, my borough here in Camp Hill. And um, 
the uh, funny thing is, is that people will walk down the middle of the street. Now you can see their sidewalks on both sides, you know, with trees and, and everything else. And people will walk down the middle of the street. And ironically, I actually think that's a good thing. If people feel comfortable enough to walk down the middle of the street, then to me, that street is calm and people feel safe in, in their community for residential street. Uh, David has a, a point um, uh, about Philly. Uh, we have Philly, yeah, if you're in South Philly and other parts of Philly, I've seen a parking is at a premium and all these spaces would be filled. Uh, then you would have a problem because you couldn't have two-way traffic there. Yeah, I, I've seen some of the uh, parking situations in Philly. Uh, they will park in intersections, they'll park in the middle of the street. <laughs> yeah, it is a, is a problem in some parts of Philly. Uh, and Darren asked a question, is it illegal to walk in the middle of the street? Uh, according to our law here in, in Pennsylvania, we have our vehicle code, Title 75. Uh, if there is a sidewalk, the pedestrian is required to walk on the sidewalk. So yes, it, it is illegal to walk in the middle of the street in Pennsylvania. Uh, fortunately, they don't enforce that here. So again, this is just a couple of photos to kind of emphasize that uh, you do your active transportation plan. Don't forget about those things that uh, in your codes and ordinances for how you design your streets, uh, how you plan out your land use. This is a situation that we have a more suburban location uh, in Dauphin County here in central Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, it's one of those things, again, by design, uh, people don't have a place to go. So we actually can look up at the top here and you can see that those are all apartments uh, up there. And what we have is that we actually have people that want to get from those apartments and they want to get down to here. So down there is where the uh, destination is. And that's where the uh, grocery store is. That is where the liquor store is. That's where the people need to go to shop. And you can see we have this giant barrier of a road. Uh, it's actually got a six lane cross section here. And so again, people are up here in this community We've got the destination they want to get down here uh, with the giant grocery store, pharmacies and liquor stores and all that. Um, so where do they walk? Do they walk all the way down the street over to the traffic signal and then all the way up here to get to the store? Where do you think they walk? I wonder if anybody is going to point it out. If you actually look really closely, you could see right there uh, that there is a, uh, let me see if I can change the color of that. If you look right there by that star, you can see the path that they walk at. Uh, so they actually cross mid block uh, across the street. Uh, this does carry, uh, just to give you an idea of the average daily traffic volume, it's about 30,000 vehicles a day. Um, and when we worked with the local police here, uh, we were working with Sergeant Cover, and he says he's out there about once a year uh, for a pedestrian fatality. Uh, and they had a pedestrian fat fatality, in fact, somebody got hit right there. Um, and there's a memorial to it. Uh, it just happened a few weeks ago and we're actually kind of standing a little bit further back watching. And we just watch people walk right past that memorial uh, for somebody who just died and just dart across the street over and over and over again. Um, and it's real interesting, the risk people will take to save 10 minutes maybe. Uh, that they'll take that risk to get across there. And again, this is something where by design, they did not accommodate people at all. All the people live here, where they want to get to is over here. And we got this barrier that acts almost like a big river uh, in between them there. Uh, so again, so very difficult to deal with. Um, some people were talking about, uh, you know, some of the things we could do. Could we put a crosswalk in here? Possibly. Um, I would not put an uncontrolled crosswalk in there. That would be a great place. Uh, if Pennsylvania did pedestrian hybrid, hybrid beacons, we actually don't do them here, but if we did, that would be a good place for it. But it's very difficult to fit in because of the high volumes. Uh, this is actually Interstate 83. This is the interchange right here. A uh, lot of busy traffic. It's a very difficult problem to kind of do it. Uh, pedestrian bridge, pedestrian tunnels, uh, something, some way to try to get people over there. But there is a median. Uh, which actually is helpful. So if we did do some sort of crossing here uh, to uh, work it through there, that would be uh, something that could be used for the benefit because they could just cross one side and not, and then cross the other instead of darting across the whole time. But again, by design, 
we made it difficult for people to get where they want to go. So again, just some of the things you want to think about in your ordinances and your codes and your comprehensive plans and things like that is making sure uh, that you take all these things. If you want your community more, more walkable and you've got that great active transportation plan, uh, don't forget these other little anim, uh, elements. Uh, one other thing that I'll point out here in, in Pennsylvania that, that is kind of an issue too is, is this here is the uh, ordinances. Uh, we have that a lot with sidewalks. Uh, we have beautiful sidewalks for a while and then as they age in Pennsylvania, sidewalks uh, maintenance is responsibility of the property owners. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to kind of enforce that. Um, and because of that, we get a lot of beat up sidewalks that are really not ADA compliant at all. And this is just an example of one project that we were involved with in, in Monroe County in northeastern Pennsylvania. And just looking at all the different communities that were involved in a kind of a regional active transportation plan and how many of their codes and ordinances addressed sidewalks, paths, trails, infrastructure for active transportation on the road and all that. And you could see it was really not covered. So again, I encourage you, if you do the active transportation plan, look at your ordinances, look at your development standards, your roadway standards and things like that, and make sure you address it there too. All right, so let's keep moving along in, in our last part here um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the connections uh, and how you can connect things. Uh, again, network opportunities and creating those connections. So the network opportunities is getting about thinking about where people live and where they want to go, where they're going to shop, uh, where they're going to access transit, where they want to play at parks and pools and things like that, and in creating those connections. And this little diagram actually kind of shows you that. So if you have the neighborhood down here, uh, and we have the town center up there, and people want to go up there to get a nice tea steak in Philadelphia, um, we need to figure out, well, how are they going to get there? What facilities do we have existing? And if we have gaps in those facilities, how can we connect them? Can we add side paths, shoulders, and different things? So that's one of the things you could think about your community is where people live and where do they want to go. Look at what existing connections you have uh, and then start looking at that system and think about how you can integrate it into a fully connected system. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, networking activity. It's described uh, in a lot of the guides that I mentioned before about how to develop an active transportation plan. Uh, in our class, we actually have several exercises related to that. Uh, a couple of things to think about um, is the importance of uh, speed and volume of traffic. Uh, and these are kind of the critical safety factors when we think about safety for our vulnerable users, for pedestrians, uh, for people on bikes, these are the big things that we worry about. And there's been a lot of studies and there's really a lot of other factors that come into play too. Uh, but uh, these are really the three critical factors they come down to in the research is speed, volume, and number of lanes uh, really affect uh, especially pedestrian safety. So let's talk about some examples about how to create those connections. You know, once you figure out where people live and where they want to go to, um, and there's some really interesting concepts out there. Uh, this again is, is uh, an example of a use of alleys uh, where we have a yield roadway. Uh, basically, this is shared public space. So this is open to cars, to bikes, uh, to people walking. Um, and it's actually, alleys are a great kind of little secret in your communities to use uh, as active transportation corridors. Uh, there's several advantages that alleys have. Uh, a, they're low volume. B, they're low speed. Um, they don't have uh, a lot of the uh, conflicts with turning vehicles and other things that you would have on major roadways. So it's one way if you don't have a lot of room on your major streets to think about uh, using alleys. Um, I also like this picture. There's one thing in this picture, if you look closely, um, you know, I, I traffic engineer, I like traffic signs. So I just want to see if anybody can see that sign here in the background and how effective do you think that the sign is? Anybody see what sign I'm talking about there? You see the sign, but you can't read it, the watch children sign. It's one of those things where I think as a traffic engineer and you, you think, well, I've got 40 kids in front of me, you know, and then there's the watch children sign. How effective is that watch children sign, <laughs> you know, in, in this case, or, or how, how, how much is it helping out in that case? Uh, 
Uh, so it, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. And uh, instantly, somebody said about the wrong direction. Uh, this alley is one way. Um, so I'm actually on my bike behind them. Um, and uh, the alley is one way uh, going the direction they're actually walking. And another example of a yield roadway, in this case, this is uh, an Elizabethtown borough uh, in South Central Pennsylvania, uh, where they actually used uh, different textured pavement uh, to designate a, a walking uh, and active transportation lane, again, on an alley. Uh, again, so they actually used this to actually connect uh, two trails on the other side of town. Uh, they used the alley as kind of the connector between the two trails, um, and they designated some space um, as opposed to this, which is completely shared here, they actually designated some space off the side uh, to, to get, help people get through there. Uh, another concept you could use is a bicycle boulevard. Uh, again, where the emphasis is actually allowing bikes to ride in the road with vehicles. Uh, and again, this would be where you have volumes and speeds uh, to actually uh, integrate uh, the two different modes uh, safely. Um, FHWA actually has a new guide that came out a couple years ago where you can actually look at the volume of traffic and the number of lanes and they actually have a chart uh, and based on that chart it will give you guidance about whether you can think about a bicycle boulevard, uh, whether you should have bike lanes or whether you know it's too high speed and too much volume and then you should have a protected bike lane. Uh, so there's actually a lot more detailed guidance on uh, selecting the appropriate feature for your roads, uh, given the conditions that you have out there and the facilities that you'd like to have. Uh, this is another concept. We don't have this uh, in Pennsylvania yet, uh, but they call this the advisory shoulder. Um, again, this is actually a two lane road. Uh, you can see we have parking on both sides. Uh, we have two traffic lanes here, uh, and we have these dashed lines here to dedicate some space for cyclists. Uh, but you can see that the vehicles can use that space also uh, when there's no cyclist. Uh, if there is a cyclist there, they're going to have to go around. Uh, and some people are already making some comments about that. Drew's pointing out door zone. Yes, uh, this is the door zone if you're a cyclist here. Um, I do have to say the worst crash I had on my road bike ever was getting doored uh, in Pasadena, California. Be cautious about driving, uh, riding my bike next to doors. Uh, it could be very confusing to drivers and, and all that too, especially in some places where you have not implemented any things like this. So again, it's one of those concepts that people are trying out there. And there may be certain road types where this would be good for uh, and others where it may not be appropriate for. So some people are saying uh, uh, not a good application. Karen's saying it could be confusing, could be confusing to all users in that case too, yeah. Uh, another simple thing you could do is add page shoulders. Uh, this is in southwestern Pennsylvania in, in uh, Connellsville Township. Uh, and it's really interesting when you look at uh, FHWA's proven safety countermeasures, uh, and they have one on sidewalks and paved shoulders. And the level of improvement with adding a sidewalk is really high. So from a safety perspective, like 80% safety improvement if you add a sidewalk. Um, but it's also just as high, about 70% with just adding a shoulder. So even just simply adding a shoulder uh, to the uh, side of a road uh, and providing that extra space for people to walk, bike, uh, is a great benefit. And of course, we also know from a safety perspective, it also benefits all road users, benefits vehicles too. So David's actually saying that you've expended with a, a, uh, the uh, advisory shoulder that's pretty, so what, yeah, so how did that work for you, David? And what community was that in? If you wanna go ahead and type that in, be curious. Uh, then moving on up, uh, then you can get dedicated bike lanes. Um, a lot of communities are using the uh, MUTCD has, a, has approved uh, the use on an interim basis of green paint for designated bike lanes. A lot of great design tools and standards out there for bike lanes. A lot of people experimenting with uh, different things. Uh, with bike lanes too. Uh, shared use paths, which are separate uh, from the roadway system. Uh, trail networks and things are another great connectivity tool. Uh, side path. Uh, the side path is a path that actually uh, parallels the road, like you can see in this case. So a shared use path, uh, you can see, is a completely separate facility away from the roadway network, uh, where a side path goes along a road. And again, side paths are, are some places they can be good, uh, in some places, they could be difficult because they are right next to the road. Uh, anytime you come across intersections, you got some interesting conflict points. 
Uh, this one is actually interesting. You can see it looks pretty good here, um, but then they uh, actually ran out of space and right of way, uh, and then actually had to go alongside the road here. They didn't do it quite well. <laughs> As you can see, I don't know where the, the green striping treatment came from uh, for there. Uh, that's uh, kind of not uh, good. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's one of those things where we run into difficulty. We have space, we have right away, we can do it, and then boom, we have a gap. How can we do it and how can we do it appropriately is something that needs to be considered. Let's see, I just got the uh, a couple minute warning here. So I'm going to go through a couple other examples real quick. So again, sidewalks. Uh, obviously very effective for pedestrian safety. And again, a lot of design details that people don't even think about for sidewalks, uh, making sure you, you meet the current ADA and other design standards. Uh, landscape buffers are great for adding to the environment and also creating some space between pedestrians and vehicles and things like that. Um, and again, where we have those gaps in our networks like bridges here uh, can be difficult to deal with. This is actually uh, in a borough, McCungie borough, uh, I'm not very thrilled with what they did here. You can see that there's a sidewalk coming from this neighborhood here. On the other side is a beautiful park with a trail system, and they're trying to connect the community uh, to that park uh, and across this bridge. Uh, and without rebuilding the bridge, this is what they did. Um, they put stop signs on either side of the bridge. They kind of striped out, I guess, a pedestrian lane there. Uh, but I really don't like this. You could see it would be confusing the drivers. Um, you could see this lane here is still going straight into the pedestrian path. So uh, not, a, not a great design there. But again, it's one of those difficult things, those gaps uh, where we have a lot of difficulty making those connections. Here's the information from Federal Highway, again, on the benefits of sidewalks and even paved shoulders uh, have a great safety benefit there. Uh, separated bike lane, uh, we're experimenting here in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, both have examples of uh, new styles of bike lanes uh, where we're actually moving the bar parking away from the curb. Um, and so now we have the parking lane that creates a buffer. Uh, we actually have a physical separation here with the delineator post, and then we have the bike traffic here along the curb. Uh, so this does a couple things. It provides actually a physical barrier uh, for the cyclists. Uh, it gets the cyclists away from the door zones. Uh, we do have an issue with the way our laws are written here in Pennsylvania about parking alongside the curb. So uh, this, uh, we need to get our laws updated to reflect these designs. And this is kind of being studied right now to see how this works out. Um, and uh, it does have some benefits uh, as long as there's not a lot of intersections. Uh, if you do have any intersections, again, you got turning traffic that are coming from behind the parked cars, uh, that could be one of the problems that in blocks like this, where there's no driveways, no intersections, uh, it could be quite an effective idea uh, for everybody. But then even think about the pedestrians over here and how much separation they have from traffic, which is great. Another example of a uh, separated bike lane uh, outside in the Harrisburg area. Again, we have a mount of a curb here that actually separates the trail uh, from the side of the road. And of course, we've got to be careful of the turtles that might be crossing there. And again, we got to think about all our different amenities uh, our, for our sidewalks and for our system, whether it's benches and trash cans and where things go, where I'm going to park my bikes. One of the things that I see is a, a interesting uh, sub issue with benches is that people never seem to place them in places where they forget about people are going to sit and actually block the sidewalk. So just one of the things there. And then lighting is very, very important also. So that's our, our quick overview of active transportation and active transportation plans. It's uh, about 8.50. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and summarize things. There's Alexis, hi Alexis. Hello. You can see the sunshine's come out here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So uh, thank you everybody for, for listening. Uh, I encourage you to look at some of those resources that we have out there uh, for active transportation planning. There's a tremendous amount. Uh, at LTAP, we actually have uh, two full four-hour classes on these topics, a lot more detailed than we're able to get into this morning. But uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Patrick, thank you so much. That was wonderful.